What brings us here is a brief history of the living dead, evolution of the zombie in popular culture. Everybody loves a zombie, and even if you don't love a zombie, you're stuck living with somebody who does. That's how that works out. I think that was for their benefit right there. Even um, Star Trek fans, we've got even our own brand. Of that's zombie. right, that's right, everybody does. So, we've got a lot of questions to answer. Why is the zombie so popular? Why is it so omnipresent? Why, why does it never seem to go away? Every, we keep waiting for this fad to die, no pun intended, but it never seems to do so. Why? We're gonna find out tonight. Now the big question in some people's minds is, why am I talking about this? Why, why, is, this, why is this something that I am theoretically an expert in? Um, these are actually comic books that I'm responsible for, uh, both of which featured zombies. Uh, one in an educational context, and the other in an entertainment context. So for these two radically different purposes, I was able to use, uh, I was able to use the zombies, source of humor, source of horror fiction, and the fact that I was able to do this, and I didn't have to convince anybody that it was viable, that it was possible, that it was something I could pull off, is itself kind of illustrative of why we're here. Why the zombies role in pop culture is worth analyzing. Um, what can we learn from its enduring popularity? Zombies everywhere, why? Lots and lots of reasons, chief among them being the fact that we can keep asking that question. Why is it popular? We can keep asking it in new ways. There are a lot of corollary questions. Case in point, what is a zombie and does this really count? Has anybody seen this movie or read the book, Warm Bodies? The movie just came out and it's basically about a zombie who sees this girl, falls in love, and starts to turn human again. And the big question is, does that even count as a zombie? Um, so you've got this creature capable of an inner monologue. It feels love. Is that a zombie? And the answer is, surprisingly, yes. Because when you get right down to it, the zombie is, is and always has been, just a mirror. It's a reflection of us. It's a way that society is able to look at itself and it's a reflection of humanity. The zombie is just a cultural metaphor through which we examine certain aspects of the human condition. We often define the zombie in terms of the rules of the genre. But the truth of the matter is, those rules really have nothing to do with the zombie. They're just genre tropes. They're just constructions. They're derived not from some canonical body of law that tells us what the zombie is about, but it just tells us how the movies are going to work. These rules are infinitely malleable as long as the zombie continues to fulfill its role as a mirror for the human experience. So when we talk about a creature like this that can fall in love, that can has an inner monologue that rises above its undead status, what we're talking about is essentially a philosophical implication that we're all zombies, just waiting to actually feel something. And it's it's kind of a stretch, but when you get that when you get to that point, you realize that if we're all worried about truly feeling something, and until then just being zombies, whether we agree with this conclusion or not, <coughs> it illustrates why we're able to love them so much, because we see in them ourselves. They have always reflected our deepest fears, and they allow us to examine our own frailties. Now, where the zombie comes from is pretty complicated. Um, it took a long way for it to get here. The first time we see the word appear in English is somewhere around 1810, 1820, kind of depends on which expert you ask. Uh, the poet Robert Southey used it. Um, but it was actually, it comes from a West African dialect, and I would probably mangle the original word if I used it. Um, so I'm not going to do so. But we have essentially two different legends that combine together into the modern zombie. We have the ghoul from Arab mythology of the Islamic Golden Age, and then we have the Haitian zombie. Now these are two completely different creatures. They have very little to do with each other. The Arab myth of the, of the ghoul is just, it's a humanoid creature that haunts grave sites and eats human flesh, okay? Whereas the Haitian zombie, that's a little more complicated. Um, in Haitian folklore, certain kinds of voodoo priests could steal your soul, and then you would basically become an ambulatory corpse that was, this, that was the slave of the zombie master. The Haitian zombie kind of reflects the, uh, some of the Haitian fears of the time. Haiti was once a slave state. Uh, eventually they rebelled. Um, they broke free from France and became free. The thing there, the implication there is that they were afraid of this notion of being re-enslaved. So their deepest fear was that they could become slaves again. So they have this myth that they constructed of the Bokor, the voodoo priest that could steal their soul and turn them back into slaves. 
When that story hit white culture, then the fear became of one of these colonial powers of the idea that these people we once treated as slaves could become our master. And it terrified these white colonialists in the 19th century. So we can see already that with the ghoul, we've got a creature that just re represents the ultimate taboo, the eating of human flesh, the perception of man as his own worst predator. Because when you sit at the top of the food chain, you have nobody left to fear but yourself. We see in the Haitian zombie a reflection of all their cultural fears. So it would take a long time for these two things to come together. And there were some other influences in between. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, first written in 1818, introduces themes of uh, man trying to subvert God and science itself becoming a, a perpetrator of the next stage of great evil. The silent film, uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is actually a German film, but if I were to say that title, I would also mangle it, came out in 1920 and actually involves a man who uses hypnosis to create this perfect killer that then wanders zombie-like around, zombie around the countryside and does his bidding. Until, of course, it turns on him, because that's how these things work. All right, that's where these themes get introduced. The idea of man destroyed by his own hubris, man as creator of his own horror. So we're already starting to hear these connections between these disparate things. Now, when the zombie enters popular culture in a form that we start to recognize, we have this man to thank for it, William Seabrook, an interesting character, a self-described journalist, a cultist, world traveler, and occasional cannibal. And there's a funny story behind that, but we'll go into that later. Uh, he writes a book called The Magic Island, and it's a, it's, it's a novel, it's fiction. Uh, it's a semi-fictive travelogue inspired by one of his trips to Haiti. And he writes a chapter in there called Dead Men Walking in the Cane Fields. And this is in 1929, and that all of a sudden introduced the myth of the zombie to Anglo culture in North America and abroad. Um, over the course of the 1930s, this idea skyrocketed in popularity. We have here this, this is a, one of the pulp magazine covers of the 1930s. By the end of the decade, the zombie was practically a cliche in pulp fiction, it appeared so much. Uh, the Corpse Master in 1929, House of Magnolias in 1932, The Grave Must Be Deep in 1934, 1935, Dead Men Kill in July 1934, Music of the Damned in 1935, uh, Zeus for Zombie, also in 1935. Uh, While Zombies Walked in 1939, which coincidentally was the first tale to feature zombies that were actually shambling walking corpses. It's a ridiculous amount of research I'm doing for this. Uh, and then uh, The Forbidden Trail uh, in 1941. It, it became a very popular archetypal monster almost overnight. Um, in 1932, Kenneth Webb wrote a Broadway play that's now completely lost to us. We don't even have a fragment of the script as far as I can find. Uh, simply called Zombie. It only ran for 21 performances, but it inspires the film White Zombie, starring Bela Lugosi uh, in 1932. By 1936, Boris Karloff is in on the act with The Walking Dead, although his zombie has nothing to do with voodoo. His zombie is a scientific creation. Likewise, in the film Dr. Blood's Coffin, from uh, all the way up in 1961, we're still seeing scientific zombies, radiation bombarding the brain and creating zombies that walk around. That film up in the corner is 1943's I Walk With a Zombie. It's a Val Luton film. Perhaps he's better known for the movie Cat People, I think, in 1940. 41, maybe? I don't know. I might be wrong. Either way, it's, uh, um, yeah, but you can still see we're juggling back and forth between these two archetypes. We've got our scientific zombie, a more akin to Frankenstein. We've got our supernatural zombie, more akin to voodoo folklore. All right? But, in 1968, George Romero changed everything. And we're gonna see exactly how he changed it tonight. But what Romero did, and to be fair, along with co-writer John Russo, uh, who did the later make other films, he's just not as famous as, as Romero. Romero modernized the myth of the ghoul. We go back to this Arabic story. When he wrote this script about corpses that came back from the grave, he never bothered to explain why, because the first rule of the zombie apocalypse is you don't try to explain the zombie apocalypse. It's just going to sound stupid. He brings them back. They eat human flesh. He never called them zombies. But the audience did. The audience did, and Romero liked it, because what Romero was trying to comment on was all this complicated sociological stuff. You know, you've got this creature that lives somewhere between life and death, that preys only on the living, 
that spreads on net like a play with its bite. Um, when we, see, we look at Romero zombies, we see the fear of contagion. We see the fear of societal collapse. Again, we see that notion of ourselves as our own worst enemy. So Romero is trying to make all this big, brave social commentary with this monster movie. So when his audience embraced the concept of calling them zombies, he loved the term. And even though he didn't bother to do it in 1968, he thereafter did. Um, what Romero was essentially trying to say with his films is that which we fear most is ourselves the disaster we might bring on ourselves. Okay, so the big question now is how do we link the two? How do we link the folkloric Haitian voodoo zombie with the modern zombie? It's not as complex as you may think. We have to be a little creative and flexible in our thinking to do so because the lineage isn't direct, but the line of reasoning to get there is conceptually pretty simple. Before we do that though, let's pause for a moment to look at just how widespread this zombie thing has become as a cross-cultural symbol. And the answer is worldwide. Okay, let's look at our films there. That one's Italian, that one's French, that one's Norwegian, that one's from New Zealand, that one's from Australia. Zombie strippers is quintessentially American. The one in the upper right-hand corner, junk, that's Japanese. Okay, so we've got a tremendous amount of representation. It's not unique to the Americas. What's most interesting is it's not unique just to former colonial powers. So we're already talking about things, broader subject matter than we were talking about at the beginning. Then we've got the video games, Resident Evil. We've got the books, World War Z, which is itself about to become a film. We've got The Walking Dead on television, based on the graphic novels that just break sales records left and right. Pervasive in virtually every <coughs> modern technological nation, regardless of their history. Zombies are observed in popular culture. Why? And that's because most stable modern societies share the same fears. It's not only why zombies are popular worldwide, but it's also how we draw our thematic connection between the earlier zombie myth and the modern version. And it's because the roots of that myth continue to resonate with us. Even when we compare Val Luton's Haitian zombie to Robert Kirkman and company's modern Walking Dead zombie. The link between the two is more conceptual than literal, with the medieval ghoul bridging the gap, but the roots are easily applied to modern fears. We've got post-colonial fears. We have that fear of what sociologists call the external other, or what those in post-colonial studies call the subaltern. The notion that this, there's this permanent underclass. What happens when that permanent underclass rises up? And that's what we see in zombie fiction. And we see that fear manifested, and well, when they rise up, there's often that message of, yeah, we kind of had this coming, didn't we? And then we have the, the implied loss of the self. We have notions of rampant consumerism. There's no coincidence that Dawn of the Dead is set in a shopping mall. I mean, that's exactly what it's trying to say. The fear that not only must we fight the external other, but through our own failures as humans, we could become the external other. That's what the zombie su summarizes there. Um, it's a modern twist on the same fear of fighting the subaltern so we don't become the subaltern. The big question, of course, is what does it all mean? Because once again, we've been reinvented what the zombie means to us. Using this word, zombie, we've all done it. Whether we're big fans of the horror genre or not. I mean, anytime we see somebody walking through life as some sort of flesh bound automaton, we're like, yeah, guy's a zombie, woman's a zombie. It's, it's a term that we use when we see somebody trudging through life, unthinking, unfeeling. It's what we fear most, that we ever, that, that we won't ever truly feel or experience anything for ourselves. Now some people would say that this latest evolution, this latest step of evolution in the stage, or this, excuse me, this latest evolutionary step in the development of the zombie, takes all the horror out of it, because now we're starting to laugh at it, in much the same way that some people thought that young Frankenstein killed the horror movie, because uh, we've taken these classic things and we're starting to laugh at them. But the truth is, we're just exploring a different nature of the exact same fear that fascinated us in the first place, because what we're looking at now is a reminder of that which we hold most dear, and that which we're afraid will be taken away from us. This latest version, all right, he's not gonna give us nightmares, 
but he might teach us the most important lesson of all, that which we take away from the zombie as really mankind's only modern monster myth. The vampire has been with us in mythology for centuries. Frankenstein's monster, you know, is a relatively modern creation, still been with us for a couple hundred years now. Werewolves, you can find those myths of those dating back to the Middle Ages. This is mankind's modern monster. And because of that, more than any other myth or monster, the zombie teaches us, most of all, what it means to be human. Thanks. Let's watch some zombie movies, shall we?